Okay, this lesson is about bond and molecular polarity, two distinct concepts. First, we'll look at bond polarity. Bond polarity answers the question, is there a separation of charge between two atoms? So we're looking to see if there's a shift in electron density in the space between two atoms involved in a bond. First, we need to consider the electronegativity, the strength of that atom, the ability of that atom to attract electrons to itself when it's involved in bonding. And hopefully you'll remember the trend of electronegativity from grade 11, where francium in the bottom left of the periodic table has the lowest electronegativity, with values increasing as you move up the group and increasing as the atoms get smaller as you move to the right of the table and therefore fluorine having the greatest electronegativity. Pauling assigned the electronegativity of fluorine to be 4.0 and all the rest of the atoms have lower electronegativities than fluorine. Ultimately, it's the electronegativity difference. So this delta symbol is read difference or change. So it's the change in electronegativity or the electronegativity difference between the two atoms that are involved in the bond that determines the nature of the bond. If that electronegativity difference is greater than 1.7, then we say the bond is predominantly ionic in character, which means there's a transfer of electrons leading to the formation of distinct electron clouds, <clears throat> which ultimately, in terms of our original question, really means that there's a complete separation of charge between the ions. So we have distinct electron clouds. We can represent that in a Lewis diagram with our symbols of each ion. The electronegativities of sodium and chlorine can be subtracted to determine their electronegativity difference, and you'll see that the difference is greater than 1.7. The electronegativity of chlorine is 3.2, and for sodium is 0.9, and you can see that the difference is 2.3 definitely greater than 1.7. Okay, on the covalent bonding side of this electronegativity difference continuum, you'll see less than 1.7 means that there's a covalent bond forming, so predominantly sharing of electrons. Whether that sharing is unequal or equal depends on how close in electronegativity the two atoms are involved in the bond. If that difference is exactly zero, it's a pure covalent bond, a nonpolar covalent bond. And you can see in the electron density here between the two nuclei, for example, if they're hydrogen atoms forming a bond in H2. The electron density, I'm trying to draw this in such a way that it shows a symmetrical distribution or an even and equal sharing of the electron clouds in this bond. The electronegativity of hydrogen comes in at 2.2, and of course, even though you didn't have to really know that, to know that the difference will be zero because both atoms are the same involved in the bond. In the case of a polar bond forming, and really, if a difference is 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, it's so weakly polar that we will classify it also as nonpolar. Essentially, above 0 0.4, moving towards 1.7, we classify those bonds as polar. There's definitely an unequal sharing of electrons there. And you can see in this picture that I've drawn the cloud at the right end of this bond, larger, right? And so more electron dense than what I've done on the left side. Symbolizing the oxygen with its electronegativity of 3.4 being more than the hydrogen at 2.2. We use these symbols delta negative, again it's a lowercase delta now, and delta positive to indicate the partial separation of charge. So this is different than the complete separation of charge. So ionic bond, complete separation of charge, we use, we have distinct electron clouds here, distinct ions, and we use this symbolism. For polar bonds, we can use the partially negative and partially positive. There still is overlap due to the sharing of these electrons, but the sharing is very unequal. So I've shown the subtraction now for the electronegativity difference, oxygen at 3.4 and hydrogen at 2.2. We can see that the delta En is 1.2, so definitely falling within the range for polar covalent bonds. Okay, moving on.
Moving on now to molecular polarity. So I have a series of steps here. You, of course, will draw on your prior experience in classifying molecules, but um, we're going to work with the vector addition of the bond dipoles. That's really what's new now compared to what you've seen in grade 11 or, or previously. So step one, we're definitely going to draw a Lewis diagram and then use our knowledge of Vesper theory to predict the shape and draw the shape diagram. On that shape diagram, if the electronegativities produce polar bonds, then we will be drawing bond dipoles. So for example, if we had a hydrogen-oxygen bond in a molecule, we would look up the electronegativities and see oxygen at 3.4 and hydrogen at 2.2 and realize that the delta En is 1.2, which means that it's a polar bond. And we would be able to draw a vector, an arrow, that points at, the arrow points at the more electronegative atom and make a little bit of a cross here at the other end showing that that's the positive end of the bond. So that arrow with the little cross at the, at the tail end is called a bond dipole. It means the same thing as putting the partially negative and the partially positive symbols there. So a dipole indicates the separation of charge. And in this case, in a covalent bond, a polar covalent bond, it's a partial separation of charge. So we can only do that, we can only draw bond dipoles for polar molecules. Sorry, for polar bonds, for polar bonds. So a nonpolar bond, like hydrogen and hydrogen here, we would not be able to draw the vector or use the partially negative or partially positive symbolism. Okay, so moving along in the steps, we're going to then add the bond dipoles, so look at vector addition. And if a resultant vector exists, then we will determine the molecule is polar. And if there's no resultant vector, then the molecule will be classified as nonpolar. The significance of that is that nonpolar molecules have essentially an equal distribution or symmetrical distribution of charge throughout the molecule, whereas polar molecules do not. There's a FET simulation that shows you how polar molecules reorient in the presence of an electric field. And so I have put that link up on OneNote under this unit, uh, this unit's tab. So I recommend you check that out. Okay, so going through the series of steps now. The first thing that was said there was to draw a Lewis diagram. So we look at the electrons for carbon and the two oxygens and place the carbon and oxygen atoms on the page, right? And we were having 4 plus 12, 16 electrons. So 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16. There's a little mark on the page there. I'm not sure what that's from. Okay. Now the carbon's not stable, so we'll need to reposition electrons. And so we come up with the double bonds to each oxygen. Okay, now consider the shape. So apply Vesper theory and consider the shape. We need to draw a shape diagram. It turns out that having two electron domains here, right, two electron domains actually then predicts the linear shape, 180 degrees. So it turns out that that Lewis diagram that I drew, and I'm just going to redraw the shape diagram here, was actually, you know, drawn correctly in terms of the shape. Now we need to indicate bond dipoles. So we look up the electronegativity for oxygen at 3.4 and for carbon it's 2.6. And so I can see that that electronegativity difference, electronegativity of the, the carbon oxygen is going to be 0 0.6, I believe. 3.4 minus 2.6, sorry, 0 0.8. So they're definitely falling in the range of polar covalent bonds. So I draw a bond dipole pointing towards the oxygen, and I draw a bond dipole of the same length. I'm trying to draw those vectors the same length because they recognize, they represent differences of 0 0.8, so identical differences. Okay, now it's up to vector addition. So the idea of vector addition is that we, we pick one of these vectors as our starting point. So I'll show the rough work below. So here's going to be my starting point. And I try to draw that vector the same length that I have it in the, in the molecule. And now from the head of that vector that I just finished, I'm going to pick up this second vector 
and position it over top and basically come right back along. Now because that means I'm going to be going right over top, I'm going to just draw below. So essentially, I have ended up right back where I started. Carbon dioxide, the carbon is experiencing this equal but opposite pull of the bond dipoles in both bonds. So because we ended up right back where we started, there is no resultant vector here. And when there's no resultant vector, the molecule then is nonpolar. Now, make an effort here to write the word molecule after you put the word nonpolar. Because the fact that the electronegativity difference was 0 0.8 meant that there are polar bonds, but notice that the overall molecule is nonpolar. Let's go through the same process again for water. So we add up the electrons and we need eight electrons for water. Position our atoms, draw the Lewis diagram. Two, four, hydrogen stable, hydrogen stable, six, eight. Now we apply Vesper theory. So we notice the central atom with two bonded and two lone pairs. Okay, so AB2, E2. All right, so we've applied the Vesper theory and when we think of the arrangement to minimize repulsive forces, we think of the bent arrangement. And so we can draw the water molecule bent at the oxygen. Okay, looking up electronegativities, the oxygen is more electronegative than the hydrogen. And yes, it does produce, as we've already calculated, a polar bond. And so we can indicate with vectors to represent the bond dipoles, the uh, separation or partial separation of charge in those bonds. Now for the vector addition. So I'm going to start with the vector on the left, just arbitrarily picked that one. So I position it, thinking that this is my starting position here. And now I pick up the second vector and place it, that maybe seemed a little bit long. Okay, try again. There, and I draw the second vector on the same angle that it was going from the tip of the previous arrow to the tail of this next one. So I can see that I started down here and I've finished up here. And so there is, I'll draw a dashed arrow here and maybe show that in a different color. There is this resultant vector, which follows the direction going right up through this molecule from lower where the hydrogens are up towards the oxygen. And that is the resultant vector. A resultant vector means that the molecule is polar. And we call this resultant vector a molecular dipole. So it's not a bond dipole. Now it's a molecular dipole. It's the sum of the bond dipoles. And it means that, that therefore this is a polar molecule. So play around with that FET simulation, and I'll have the Chromebooks in class so we can do that too. And you'll you know, really get to understand the significance of the polarity in a molecule. Okay, now to connect this concept to the Vesper theory that you've learned um, previously, I'd like you to review the Vesper shapes below and classify each molecule as either polar or nonpolar based on the vector addition of the bond dipoles of any polar bonds. I'm providing element A and B with their electronegativities at 2.6 and 2.0. Okay, so really you're analyzing the different Vesper shapes for their molecular polarity and we will discuss this in class. So I'm expecting you to come in with your best attempt at the bond dipoles drawn into these shape diagrams and your best attempt at the vector addition. Now you won't be able to model that vector addition in three dimensions on paper for sure, but you need to imagine and try to come up with a decision of whether a resultant vector is uh, produced or not. So you'll see that I have the various shapes. So take a moment and copy these down. 
and do your best to classify these molecules as being polar or nonpolar molecules.